Welcome you all to another session on machine learning in our course on descriptive, prescriptive, predictive analytics for practitioners. We talked about uh, supervised and unsupervised learning uh, in the previous sessions. We got an intuitive grasp of the same. Uh, today, I will let me first begin with discussing another very popular form of machine learning which is called reinforcement learning. In uh, modern times, uh, currently if you go through the literature and go through the buzz around reinforcement learning, uh, this is also people they call it AI or uh, artificial intelligence. Though this was not exactly what was artificial intelligence uh, always, artificial intelligence is a much older field. But these days uh, in many places when the people talk about artificial intelligence, they are actually talking about reinforcement learning. So, reinforcement learning is uh, somewhere say between supervised and unsupervised learning, though it is a different uh, breed altogether. So, what happens in reinforcement learning is that you have one final output. So, for example, in supervised learning you have different data points, you have data point 1, so which are say if you talk of regression, we have x 1, x 2, x 3, x 4, x n and then we have a dependent variable y. So, similarly you have d p n, x 1 n, x 2 n. So, this may be x 1 1, this is x 2 1. So, you have these multiple data points and for each data point you know what is the desired value. So, this may be y 1, this may be y n. So, the goal in supervised learning is to train the data such that the difference between this y 1 and the predicted y 1 that you get from the model is uh, minimal. In reinforcement learning, you do not have these. Instead, what you have is a final output, final output of success or failure 1 or 0. So, just to give an example, one of the examples may be just for uh, say game of chess. So, in game of chess each of these different axes could be different moves that you make and after all the moves that you make as per the rules of the game, you get a final success or a final failure 1 or 0. So, the goal of a reinforcement learning based algorithm is to optimize each of those moves, each of those unit axes that led you to the final outcome. So, this 1 or 0 success or failure this is called reinforcement. So, this comes from uh, some classical theories of uh, behavioral sciences that emerged in early 20th century, late 19th century. Uh, if you would have heard about for example, Pavlov's experiment and many such experiments. The whole idea was to give somebody a final feedback of success or failure and then hope that the organism, the human or even animals, they adapt, they learn and then they optimize the system to create, maximize their rate of success. So, this is called reinforcement learning. Uh, in modern times, if you want to study more about it, you can read some new books which take this topic, call this topic artificial intelligence. We will not get into details of this. Let me now move to another important topic, uh, which I would say are very crucial even before you begin your machine learning or your model building exercise. So, one is so these I would I would call them as two important, but 
often ignored aspects of machine learning. So, the first is flexibility versus making sense. If I have to use a more technical word for this, I may call it interpretability, which in layman terms is trying to figure out what the hell is that I am trying to do. So, if I have to roughly plot this on a graph, if I plot flexibility of the model versus difficult to understand. So, you will find that apart from very rare cases, it is almost this curve, which means that as you make the model more flexible. By flexible, I mean you have more parameters that adjust to give you the final results. There are more ways in which the parameters interact and adjust with each other. So, you bring more and more flexibility in the model, but what happens is that the model becomes very difficult to understand. So, a flexible model is not always as we will see in the, the second ignored aspect of machine learning, but very often it fits very beautifully in the data on which you train the model and it gives you great results. It looks very exciting. Uh, and because there is a huge amount of now computational power we have at our disposal, it is often we, we are almost kind of inclined towards we are kind of uh, uh, I would say we have a natural attraction towards using more and more complex or so called flexible models. Now, an extreme example is what is in fashion these days something called deep learning. So, deep learning is nothing but a fancy term for what used to be called neural networks some years ago. Neural networks were very complex structures, maybe just to represent they were kind of these different nodes, each node would run some mathematical formulae and then it will pass the input to another set of nodes. So, there will be cross linkages uh, you can define and then in every node the first part will aggregate all this together and then it will be another mathematical function then it will pass on and maybe here there are multiple nodes and finally, one node and this will be the output. So, you could play around with the mathematical formula, the mathematical function you used. You could play around with the way you sum up the values. You can normalize, you can standardize, you can do a lot of things. You could play around with the number of these nodes in neural network language called neurons. So, you can have multiple layers. So, this is just a maybe a three layer. You could have say another layer here. So, there could be multiple layers and deep learning is nothing but trying to create more deeper, more wider, more networked, more number of layers in neural network and then trying to get as flexible as complex an output as possible. The pitfall yes, uh, it definitely drastically increases your uh, uh, accuracy. You can train the model to give really good results, but there are two major pitfalls. Number one, it is computationally expensive. Uh, and often in the era of uh, cloud servers, uh, you have to pay for every bit of computation that you use. So, unless the results justify something that we discussed earlier, 
um, they may sometimes not make sense. The other part is that consider a scenario where you know the model starts acting rogue. So, if you recall that uh, movie of uh, Rajni Khan that robot. So, that robot he made a very fantastic robot and the robot then started acting rogue it became a villain. And often a case it has happened especially in uh, business scenarios in uh, especially in business analytics often what happens is that organizations in their enthusiasm they go for something like a very complex model like uh, this uh, say deep learning for example or earlier there was a lot of enthusiasm for support vector machines another set of complex algorithms. And then the model would not run after some time it would not give the desired result. The reason is that you have no no way to control or understand what these linkages are, what is the logical reason behind these linkages. It is almost like a black box. So, it is like a black box input comes output happens. Unlike this for example, if you look at a regression model, in regression model you get the parameters which are important, you get various coefficients of each of those parameters, each of those terms in the equation which give you a relative kind of a sense of how important this factor is like you get your t statistics, you get a variety of things to understand which variables are important, which are not and if a model is not working fine you can actually figure out and understand that maybe uh, in the new population, the new data that I am getting certain variables are not important. For example, you were running a marketing campaign and uh, earlier age was an important variable. Now, age is not coming important. So, maybe the choice of the people have changed uh, the, the uh, typically products liked by young the olds are slightly more conservative and it takes time for old people to accept a new innovative product or a new fun product cool product what they say the cool factor. So, cool factor actually decays over time and then so, age may be an important variable for a cool product that you brought in today, tomorrow it may not be there. So, all you have to do in a regression equation is to simply remove that variable maybe recalibrate the model and you are done. And often at times certain variables will not be important. So, even if that variable is not bringing results the rest of the variables will be able to hold the fort. In case of a deep learning method uh, because you do not even know what is happening sometimes it may over train. So, there is a this concept of overtraining, which will again come in a while in the next point. What happens is that you do not even know how it has trained itself and sometimes you get really weird results. As a classic example, I think this was for some time done in US. The military is said to have used a very state of the art neural network to identify certain tanks. So, the photograph would be there and they have to identify whether that particular object is a tank or not from a distance and uh, it worked very beautifully, but then when they uh, started to use it the model started failing very very I would say hopelessly. The reason was that what the model actually did was coincidentally all, all the photos all the images that they gave to the model to train it were of tanks in daylight. So, the model instead of uh, training itself to identify the tank it trained itself to identify daylight. So, whenever a model of a tank came which was in night it would say it is not a tank. So, because it was a neural network there are no factors nothing there is no way you could have figured it out unless you have done a very thorough testing. And often in business situations what happens is that because the number of variables are so huge, because the number of spurious variables that can also crop in are so huge that the chance of you missing something important or the model training itself on some of those really spurious things becomes really high. So, always keep in mind and I think this is what we started in the beginning and let me again re-emphasize 
that unless you have a real real valid reason to go for a complex model or a more flexible model. A simpler model, a model that you can understand, a model that you can also think about, you can, you can use your own intuition and business sense also around it might be more useful. Yes, for things like image recognition, for things like videos, things like more, more non-human data, if I have to generalize and say. For those kind of things, uh, definitely some of these advanced models, they would work fantastic. For speech recognition, it will work fantastic, these deep learning and advanced, the more flexible models. But when you come to things like doing market research, customer segmentation, things like cross sell, up sell, uh, even understanding the behavior or the performance of your employees. So, these kind of human data, management related data, they are unless you have a real, real valid reason, uh, a simpler model with more thorough data analysis done, data stewardship, data cleaning done and all the rigorous steps of model building and model validation adopted, that would definitely, apart from very rare cases, would come useful. The second important point I want to again mention and which is almost an extension of the previous in terms of its interpretation is bias versus variance trade off. So, basically I will not get into the maths of it, but the error, the gap between the actual and the predicted values that you get from a model, we are talking about supervised learning models out here. You can represent the error to be equivalent to bias. plus variance. Now, bias is in more intuitive sense error of approximation and variance is adaptability to data set. So, what happens is more the flexibility of the model, more the complex model, what happens is the error of approximation, which is in simpler terms y minus y cap. So, when you try to minimize y being the actual uh, output and y cap being the predicted output, when you try to minimize this uh, totally and you remove the bias completely, the variance or in a way the, the unsystematic error I would say, that actually increases. So, you have taken care of the error you fit. So, as a, let me give an extreme example. So, you have this uh, y versus x and there are for example, different data points. So, typically you can always create do a curve fitting and create a model, which is almost like this. So, things like uh, splines, simple let us call it curve fitting. So, what you do is you, you, you create a model, you create an equation which passes through all these points. So, what happens is in the whole process, you may feel that well, once this is there, now in this particular case, my difference of actual and predicted values is actually 0. But the moment you bring a new data set, so, there is our new data points which come which are further here. This model will fail to adapt to this new data set. While had you used a say a regression line, it would still work 
for these data sets. In this case, there would be this error, there would still be this bias, but the model will still work. So, what is happening is that more the more you adapt the model to a particular data set, it loses its ability to predict the things with equal robustness in future. So, with a new data set, it is, it is this is again this is something which is called over training. So, your model was so much trained in the existing set of data that when a new set of data came, it never did not have any clue what to do. So, such models, so typically when you create, when you take use more complex models, these models will fit because there are more variables, more parameters in the model, they will fit very accurately with the existing data set. But then when you run the model on a new data set, the predictions often come out to be very poor. And uh, that is why you always have to strike a balance between bias and variance. If you use a very simplistic model, what happens is there is always this error of approximation. So, for example, if you use a regression model, uh, regardless of whatever you do, there is going to be some amount of error, because regression by definition says that it will try to create, a, it assumes that the world is a straight line, it assumes everything that deviates from a straight line is an error point and it will try to minimize those errors. So, even in the best of the case, the best of the regression model, there will still be some error, because the whole model is defined by minimizing error and not making it 0, the least square distance, least square error the way we call it. In case of uh, more complex models, a very high degree polynomial model, it may fit very accurately, but then the moment a new data set comes, the model fails you need to strike a balance. From a practitioner standpoint, if I have to give you certain useful tips, when you go on your machine learning journey, the number one would be start with simplest model. In many cases, you do not even need to use machine learning, but a simple descriptive analysis of the data, some graphs, some pie charts may also do the trick for you, some tables. So, start with the simplest, often try regression and then incrementally improve the complexity of the model. And for every time when you increase the complexity of the model, try to understand whether the cost of this complexity is justified by better accuracy or better stability. And when you build the models, again be humble, there will be errors. Often in new enthusiastic machine learning programmers, I see this uh, urge to try to eliminate errors and one of the simplest things and as we discussed just uh, in the previous slide that you know if you try to overfit and try to remove the error totally that may actually be a blunder. So, understand there will be an error because you never get accurate data, there is always noise in the system. Your goal is not to eliminate error, but to manage error and here comes and especially if you are from a management field, if you are doing this analysis for say field of finance, field of marketing, field of human resource, please know that Accuracy is not that important. Yes, it is important. Most of the literature in machine learning, most of the literature in data analytics in general is all about trying to improve the accuracy, but there is always that hidden message and that is why we have so many complex techniques. If you just have to remove increase accuracy and remove errors, as I said curve fitting may be the best way, 
given the computational powers we have. Accuracy is the, the hidden message is always that yes accuracy is important, but accuracy is not everything. Especially if the data is noisy, the data is coming from sources which are not designed to provide data with infinite precision, more so say human data. In that case more than accuracy, stability of model becomes more important. And this has lot of repercussions, because in an, in, a, in, a, in an enterprise setting, a very accurate model that dies after some months, you have to again rebuild the model. So, it is always better to have a model which is more stable, which can run with you for a longer period, than work with a model which is very accurate and uh, will die. So, you have a choice, whether you want to keep building a new model, there is a price to building a model, there is a price to maintaining a model, there is a whole uh, number of steps that you need to do before you bring a model to production. So, whether you want accuracy or you are willing to compromise that accuracy for stability. So, you have to find. So, often you will see that uh, that uh, that 80 20 Pareto rule that is more so valid in, uh, in case of uh, machine learning models. You will find that well the incremental benefit that you get in many cases beyond say a regression or a logistic regression model, a simple linear model is just may be 5, 10 percentages of uh, accuracy improvements. But do you want that accuracy for a model that will die closely? Is the price, the value that you generate so high? Maybe, maybe not. So, yes often what is done many a times for different kinds of segments of people, people build different models. So, if you have for example, you are making a model for uh, your customer management. So, for the, the H and I segment, where you know that the price of uh, you know spending every, every dollar that you spend on treating these customers as VIPs and nurturing them is well paid off, you may go for more accurate, more robust models, because it is also a, a data set that you can manage. You have individuals who are also personalizing the relations, but if you are going for uh, a model for the normal population. So, for example, in your if you are in the business of credit card. So, if you have a credit card whose annual rate is say 1 lakh rupees or something, you know it is only the celebrities who are going to take that card. So, for those kind, the kind of models that you build, they can be more accurate models. For rest of the population, you may well do with uh, more general models, which will be stable run over time. And again, the irony comes here also that if, if these are such high net worth uh, individuals on whom you are giving your individual attention then you actually do not need that amount of model. You need more of trying, uh, more of ways to convert the, the human judgment of people in relation with them into something more sensible than, use, than using all maths to target these people, because in any case these relationships have to be very, very customized. So, if you ask me in a business setting, there are not many, many, many uh, situations where you would prefer to go for really complex models. You may do it for a hobby, you can do it as a secondary model to maybe test certain things out, but in most cases simpler would be best. And that brings me to the, the fourth point, which is Unless you have a reason, in most of the business settings, you always prefer interpretability over flexibility. You need to have models, which you can intuitively understand, which you can make uh, sense about. Uh, many of the 
top notch analytics firms whose entire business thrives on analytical modeling and who have the the server capacity to run the most complex models they still work on simple models like regression in most of the cases the simple reason is that that helps their senior management to also understand what the model is doing tweak the models when situation suddenly change the economy suddenly changes it also helps them play around experiment with new kinds of products and stuff and make sure that the model is their slave and they are not being slaves to the model however if you are using a model for uh, something like graphics images different kinds of patterns reliability est estimates for machines and stuff there probably more flexible models the non human settings there these flexible models may be more relevant so some let me just for example give some examples like if you are modeling customer default i would say simple is better if you are trying to model market i mean stock currency commodity rates there probably you can play around with more flexible models though i doubt and this is again a, an area of debate if you are using say surveillance based models object tracking so for example uh, uh, model to track presence of any spurious uh, person around your secured area so uh, more often this is more of an image problem often in high security zones they use it or you want to make a model for drone flight there you can use more flexible models however in this case you will have to make sure that the model is smartly embedded and each time you don't have to because these have to be more of real time decisions and hence you cannot afford to have models where the calculation of the output itself takes time so the model building may be a very complex process you can play around but then finally once you have built the model that model should be something which is very quick to execute so depending on this on different types of uh, uh, situations uh, for voice recognition for uh, image recognition two are very classic examples where this deep learning is very useful uh, maybe for uh, behavior of uh, the the patterns understanding patterns of success failure in casinos that is where deep learning may be very useful but something more down to earth something more humane uh, human resource performance evaluation stuff like that definitely go for a simple model so we covered the broad essence of uh, machine learning today uh, in the next session we will go through the entire uh, gamut of uh, machine learning algorithm uh, we will also talk about certain important things that you need to take care of to make sure your models are not only built well but they are also validated so as that you can sleep with peace that the model will run uh, with stability on any new data set so thank you very much